Добро пожаловать на миссию Кваси Забанту в Южной Африке. I was called by the Lord more than 30 years ago into the into mission work and a need arose at this mission because the previous missionary's wife got ill and I was asked to come and stand in the gap which I did 10 years ago. Well, this piece of land where the mission is was given by the chief of the Shongwe tribe. He went to the main mission and he saw the development and the blessing that it brought in amongst the Zulu people. So he wanted the same thing amongst the Swazi people. That it ended up in this village, Schultzendal, which is the poorest and the darkest village Shongwe tribal area. So the mission happened to be here and it was God's doing. So the mission was asked to come and start here, uh, to bring the light to bring the gospel to the people, but also to bring development. Uh, there's a huge need with people with AIDS, suffering from AIDS. There's many orphans in the area and many people in bondage to witchcraft and ancestral worship and other sins like alcohol and all the common ones. To open well. their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of mm -hmm. Satan unto God, as the book of Acts says. And then to help them, to help the whole men, to be able to provide work for them, to create opportunities for employment, mm -hmm. to educate the children, the orphans, uh, to look after the sick and the dying, and to give them a chance in life, to give them some hope, mm -hmm. because they don't have much hope and it's very, things are in a very bad way in these areas, in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. When I was young, uh, I felt like I didn't get the love that I was expecting at home. And I thought if I maybe studying dating, I would have that love. So because my mom and my father were separated, so I couldn't get that love. So I started dating boys like my age, but I didn't have that love. I think it wasn't enough. I was dating the older men so that maybe they can give me money to buy some things that I wanted. Some expensive cell phone, expensive clothes, hairstyles like my friends. But still, I didn't get that far. And then I continued to work in the, at the street to sell my body. But still, I didn't get that far. So. And how has the mission grown? Going back to 10 years ago when you came first time and now looking back, what has happened during this time? Well, by God's grace, it has grown quite a lot. We would like to see it grow faster, but it has grown quite a lot. When, we, when I came here, there was not much. There were three buildings, a chicken house and a mill, and now that has grown. We have a big farm where we produce uh, green peppers and other vegetables. The mill has grown. We have a school which we didn't have with 94 children, many of them orphans and vulnerable children. And different projects have been added to it. The church has grown, I would say, from 60 people to 200 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also another kind of work that you do is village outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about that work? Yeah, well, if every Tuesday and every Thursday and sometimes other days we reach out, we go to different villages in the area, to different homes where we preach the gospel to small groups of people. But we go to their homes, we try and reach them in that way, see how they live and bring hope and light to them. We also plan, which we haven't done, uh, but plan to do this year still is to reach out with a tent into the villages for bigger outreaches mm -hmm. for two weeks at a time to attract those who you don't get in church. And then the mission, we also have conferences? Yeah. Yes, we have two conferences. We have a youth conference in September, October normally that draws about 1,500 young people mm -hmm. for four days. We have a minister's conference in May this year, normally around about that time. That's still quite small, maybe 150 ministers, pastors and preachers. And then, of course, Easter conference, Christmas mm -hmm. conference, those are regular. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have family uh, 
camps and things like that as well. And then about the services every Sunday, there are services as well? Every Sunday regularly, 11 o'clock every Sunday, yeah. we have our main worship service. And the services are for people that are outside or just for inside? For anybody. They come from far and near. They come from the village. Some are regulars, mm -hmm. some many first-timers that come to here. So it's open for anybody to come. Okay. Where do we see this mission going? What are the current needs? And what are you hoping to get within maybe a plan for the next five years? Well, only God knows that. Mm -hmm. But humanly speaking, I would say what uh, Erlo Stegen, who's the director of Quasis Abantu Mission, he said to me that this mission should be bigger than the one in Natal because there's more people here. <laughs> in this area there are a million people. So uh, there's a huge harvest. So by God's grace we hope to grow the, the church, uh, not because we want a church, but to reach more people, uh, to reach out to more people, uh, we want to build a clinic for looking after those suffering from AIDS and tuberculosis and different sicknesses because there's a huge need for that. The school will still grow hopefully into a uh, technical skills training mm -hmm. school which will give the children some future. So those are some of the things that, we, that we're looking at. One day is just I have a call from my grandpa and then he told me that my son asked him that does my mom love me and then he couldn't answer that so he called me that maybe you should answer him because I, I don't know what can I answer him because at the first time, the time I got my son I even tried to kill him because I didn't want him and that had really touched my heart and I couldn't sleep, I, I don't know what happening and then we started fighting with my friends because I didn't go to work really like all days at the, the street and then I came back at home and then they welcomed me and then my grandma said you should go to the mission because there is they said there is the youth conference and then when I came here And that's how you gave your life to Jesus? Yes. And so, from the streets, from selling your body, from wanting to kill your child, from just for one thing, not having that love. And now you found that love, and that love overflows you. And the great thing is that you have your son here with you now, and he is going to our school here as well. One other project in the mission that we have, it's a mill, corn mill, and Nico, he is the manager of it. Thank you for showing your mill. Can you tell us a little bit about this project and how it helps the mission and what are the future plans for the mill? Okay, let me just take it back there. We okay. did the mill started a number of years ago and it's still going. It started as a very small project and it's grown to, to the size it is now. And obviously our future plan is to expand the mill, move it, we've put projections, we've actually projected and we put a proposal together. For, for, for the mission to, to expand it. I think our vision and our mission is to support the local community. Um, currently, the law supports the school, we support the kitchen area, we support the local community by giving them a good product at a very good low price, and all the profit generated goes back into the school, goes back into the mission. We, as the law, don't get any safety. From a personal view, I'm very delighted to be involved with, the, with this project and foresee in the next few years to expand it into a, a separate business unit. Now, um, you have been a, really a running force for the mill. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why did you come to this mission and what are you doing here? Well, I think it's, it's a good time to keep it simple and, and short for you. Um, I'm a marketing man, first of all. I've been involved in marketing major companies, um, but obviously things went wrong in life, and I turned my life around, I came to this mission with, with God's help, and he's put me here, and I'm part of his plan, hopefully to expand this project. Thank you very much for everything you're doing here on the mission. 
John, would you please uh, share with us what kind of people are you serving here? Who comes to the mission? And what kind of culture do they bring with them? If you can share with us a little bit about mm. that. Well, the Swazi people are people who are still of the most traditional people in South Africa that stick to their traditions, their, their culture, their belief system is one of worshipping the dead, the ancestors. And they go to witch doctors, which they call Sangomas or Inyangas, to invoke those spirits and to speak to them and to ask their help. So their religion is one of fear. So they are very deeply trapped and bound by this because they fear the spirits of the dead. So if these people get sick, it's not just sickness. It's something to do with the ancestors. There's something wrong somewhere and they've got to go to the witch doctor and find out what's wrong and why are the ancestors unhappy. And if somebody dies, it's never just a plain sickness. There's some sinister thing behind it. That's what they believe and they are really deeply entrenched in it. Uh, the older people, it's only by a, a great miracle that they can be released from this. That's why we aim to uh, reach the young people and the children with the gospel before they get into this uh, system of fear. So that's the kind of people. We get people coming here with uh, who are bound with demons. They things that they do that they tell us you know that we've seen when we pray for people needles coming out of their ears and one girl that came here had 28 needles come out of her ears and out of her body in other places and other strange things so the specific girl who this happened with uh, she belongs to a certain satanic cult in the village they claim to leave their body and go underground, under the water. They can live underwater, they say. They can go to churches and they look for people who are worldly, people who still smoke, people who uh, are fashionable and that, and they attack those kind of people to destroy their, their faith. They even cause accidents. They climb into taxis, the black combi type of taxis and they will cause accidents where everybody will die excepting the satanist who is on the taxi so it's a very dark world and those those things are prevalent and even christians are involved with these things there are many churches in the area but very few who have actually departed from the ancestors they mix christianity with the ancestors they say no there's nothing wrong with respecting your ancestors, but it's not a matter of respecting them. They worship them, they speak to them, they consult them for help and for different things. Mm -hmm. And that is why they are so poor. That is why they are so sick, because they believe what the witch doctor says, not what the medical doctor says, or what the gospel says. So they suffer because of their belief system. Mm -hmm. And let's say, you say they come into the church and they look at people. What kind of people are they looking for? Do actually these demons go into Christian people as well while they're in the church? Or how does... They target lukewarm Christians because they cannot do anything to a Christian who's on fire for God and who's got a pure life. The devil cannot touch such a person. But a person who is on the fence, you know, a Judas type of one who's doing petty sins and playing the, the fool, they target those people, just as the devil did with Judas and entered him and destroyed him. And so this culture is very different from what uh, people in the West know. Very different. There are things that they tell us and that we've seen and experienced that you cannot believe in the West that it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say there are people who are hoping to come and serve God, and they want to come to Africa, they want to come to this mission. What would you recommend them, what they must do before coming here? Well, people who want to come as volunteers to come and help, they need to have a relationship with the Lord and to, to be, be sure that they 
walk with God, walk in purity and in holiness and give the devil no place because these things are real and uh, the devil is real and we're fighting a real spiritual war. So people who want to volunteer and do the Lord's work must be serious about it. It mustn't just be some outing and uh, that won't help, that won't do any good to anybody. The other thing with these people is they look at Christians to see if we are genuine, if we really mean it, are we serious, do we believe what we preach. So your life has to be right. Unemployment is round about for 40 to 50 percent of the people are unemployed in this area. So there's a huge need, there's a lot of poverty and many people come asking for jobs. But we can only employ so many, which we have done. We are probably the biggest employer in the village. So we've created employment and uh, some people earn some money from the farm work and all that. But many stand on their knees and beg at the gate for work. And when we tell them we cannot give them work, they say we'll work for food alone. And we give them food. Eventually, after a month or two, you feel so bad, you, you don't just give them two meals a day, but we give them more to take home, and that, although we cannot afford it, because the farm cannot carry that much. But we do our best to help all those that we can help. The need is so great, we, we are just touching the surface. There's a huge need. Even the government comes to ask for help. No. And what government wants from you? Money or food. <laughs> Money or food. <laughs> the ruling party yeah. comes to us, brings people to us and says, these people don't have food at home, can you not help them? We haven't got money. And so yeah. we have a few people like that that work on the mission that were brought by the ruling party who said, we can't help them, can you help? There are so many women like that who are looking after a whole lot of kids because their daughters just have babies and leave them with the grandmother or the mother and uh, there's no food and they come and ask for food they ask for help we provide for them we buy them milk we buy them food and some of them that live nearby we tell them to come and eat at the mission at least come and have a meal when we have a meal in the evenings just to give them something so there's a lot of single moms here as well that is a understatement the majority of homes are single mothers there are no fathers it's mostly that women just have babies they have no hope so they just latch on to any man that says he loves them and they have a baby and he leaves them. So that's, that's the majority are like that. One girl that came to us with a baby, she said, please won't you take this baby because I've met a boyfriend and he said he will have me but I've got to kill the child. She says, and I don't want to kill it. Won't you take the baby so that I can marry him? And that's tragedy that some, some girls would actually kill the baby without even thinking twice just to have the hope of getting a man that might be able to support them. And he just abuses her and throws her away again. You know? And then she has this on her conscience that she killed a child or dumped it somewhere on a dump. The big part of your job is counseling people. So different kinds of people come to you for help, for prayer, for support. And yes. so if you can tell us what kind of people have you been working with well, all kinds, drug addicts, alcoholics, uh, people with occultic problems, you know, bondage to de demonic things and ancestral worship, people with marriage problems, although with the Swazis, you don't find many married ones, but you do get them. they normally just in a relationship, and we have to counsel them of how to, when they become Christians, they cannot just live together anymore. They have to now get married and they need a lot of counseling in that regard as well. So, um, the work, there's a lot of work and you're alone <laughs> as far as the spiritual work. Uh, what do you think needs to happen um, to, ex to expand this work and to maybe if other people could come and, and help in the spiritual aspect? Well, Jesus said, 
the harvest truly is great and it is white. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send workers. So that's what we need. God sent people who have a calling and who have a gift to work with people and to help people spiritually. We have to pray for that. We all have to pray for it. I pray for it. You must pray for it. Everybody. That the Lord will send the right people. It's not some... It's not a kind of job where you can employ somebody who's got the right qualifications. It's got to be a calling of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And let's say somebody does come here. Um, will the mission pay them to come or how? No, the mission does not pay any volunteer or spiritual worker or somebody who is called. When God called me, I had to trust God to look after me. The mission does not pay me. The mission does not pay its uh, spiritual workers. We pay employed people who do the physical, practical work. From the village, people from that the come village, looking yes. for But people who are volunteer missionaries are not paid. They have to see to their own support on their knees. On their knees. <laughs> on their knees. <laughs> That's yeah. the only support. God will provide, <laughs> yes. whether it be through family or support from somewhere. But we do not provide that. The mission does not. And you have... We've had quite a few volunteers already, and has anybody suffered of coming here, not having food or shelter, just <laughs> trusting no. God? Nobody has suffered, nobody's gone to bed hungry as far as I know. <laughs> uh, God provides how He provides, that I cannot tell you. God provides always in an amazing way. If you ask me how it works financially, I have to say I don't know. Only God knows how it works because a normal farm with a few families or so many people living on it cannot be sustained by a normal farm operation. Uh, it's God's doing, it's God's work and we give Him the glory.